Thank you. Last speaker. Uh, it's great to be here at the FedEx convention where we talk about shipping across the world. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a bit of an irony that uh, a, a conference that's based on the premise of sharing great ideas has asked me to come to talk to you, to you about why sharing is going to kill you. And you might think that, you know, I've invented a, a sort of tabloid headline that I would sort of slowly backpedal and sort of end up sort of meekly somewhere where I would say, well, sharing could be bad if you're a dyslectic sort of senior citizen. <laughs> but I won't. I'm going to stand by my headline and I'm going to take you through a little bit of a, of a, uh, of a journey to get there. Uh, because you, you might be thinking that, hey, sharing, isn't that natural? Have we done that since the beginning of time? Isn't that part of human nature? Isn't that why we've constructed such a great and interesting society? Uh, isn't sharing second nature? It is. But along the way came something that disrupted that. Technology. I'm going to start somewhere a little off-center, and I'm going to come back to my main point, but I'm going to start somewhere else. I'm going to start with food. I'm not a great cook, so it's not about brilliance in the kitchen. But, cook, but, but food is interesting because wherever there's enough food, in markets, regions, countries, if you like, where there's enough food, what is the number one health issue? Obesity. We eat too much. Now, how can it be that something that's supposed to keep us healthy and alive is also the biggest threat to our health? Well, the easy answer, the short answer to that, is evolution. Through tens of thousands of years, we've evolved from having no food to now suddenly having food. We've been, uh, we've, we've been hardwired, if you like. We've been genetically coded to live without food. For tens of thousands of years, we struggled. We, we barely survived. And we've been programmed to crave and harvest food wherever we could find it. That's part of our basic instinct. And that's why also we struggle when we meet an abundance of food. We meet abundance, we don't know how to control ourselves. I'm going to take you to another health issue. In markets where there's ample health care, what do you think is the biggest drain on those health resources? Or in markets where there's enough health care for the population at large, what is the single biggest threat to that resource? Overdiagnosis. We overdose on health care. Overdiagnosis. Overdetection, overtreatment, overmedication is the biggest threat. Uh, this year, so the first global conference on overdiagnosis, where, where medical staff, where doctors and healthcare workers from around the world gathered to talk about this. Because overdiagnosis is skewing the health resources and it's actually a global issue. And what is it? Well, again, we meet abundance. We don't know, we can't control ourselves. We overdose on healthcare. I'm going to take another topic that's quite recent, and it's this. <laughs> Throughout time, most intelligence people, because they are people, have looked across the world and said, what if we could have access to all the information in the world? Well, suddenly you can. Technology had made it possible to access all the information in the world. Met with abundance, the NSA took the plunge into the pool of plenty. Is it evil or is it human? Well, it's up to you to decide, but my observation is that there is a pattern here. And what is the pattern? Well, constraint used to lie within our surroundings. We were limited by our surroundings, by the environment. But today, technology has enabled us to go beyond that. That means that constraint must come from ourselves. And that is hard, because that is going against your hardwiring. That is going against your programming. 
your genetical coding, if you like. And that's tough. <clears throat> so, back to sharing. Social sharing is thus nothing new. We've done it since the beginning of time, you're absolutely right. It's what made us who we are, a sophisticated civilization uh, that specialized and became the, the master species on Earth because we were very good at cooperating and sharing information. Sharing is many things, but it's, uh, it's passing on information that is vital to your survival. And again, that's how we're coded. That's how we grew up. That's our thousands and thousands of years of programming. We saw information. We saw signals. You know, the front end of information is signals. We were always looking for signals and information because we knew it would keep us alive. It would tell us where food was. It would give us shelter. It would give us love. It would give us affinity. All these things. So we know, genetically, we know, instinctively, we know <coughs> that information is important. We embrace information. As with food, we crave and we harvest information where we can find it. Now that's fine when constraint lies within the environment, within the surroundings. But when technology changes that, what happens? Well, we overdose on information. And that is an issue. That wasn't me, by the way. So the first, ah, there was my slide, OK. So the first threat I see is, is this. The massive onslaught of useless information we are creating is a threat to your life, well, at least your mental uh, ability, to your mental powers. Uh, and, uh, and not only is uh, information more accessible today, but, it, but information has become automated. An example is that uh, all your digital connections, uh, what, what Facebook is calling frictionless sharing, and others call it different things. Frictionless means friction is taken away. Friction, that's you. You're taking out of the equation. Uh, the information is just rolling in. Automated updating. That means any digital connection you have, all they're doing online is being fed back to you. So they're reading something, they're uploading something, they're watching something, listening to something, they're participating in something, they're connecting with somebody. Ding, 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 ding. All, uh, that, all that is wired to you. All that is, 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 is updated to you. And that creates a tsunami of garbage in my mind. A tsunami of so much information, it's hard to deal with. Still, we're hardwired to embrace it. Still, we're hardwired to take it on because instinctively we know it's important for our survival. Now that creates uh, an issue. And there, 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 are, there are several aspects of this. I'm not going to go too much into it. But of course, there's a huge commercial pressure for this to happen, because media companies, uh, uh, software developers, and advertisers, and marketing people are all very, very inter interested in this because it feeds into what is eventually called big data. <clears throat> and out of big data comes potentially bigger market share and, of course, a pattern, a pattern that tells them what you're interested in, which makes it easier for them or us to sell stuff to you. And that's all fine. It's consumer behavior, but it's up to you whether you want to participate in big data or if you want to retract and be part of, let's say, small data. It's all up to you. When faced with abundance, I plunge in. I love the water here. The second issue with this is that when so much information is out there, and most of it is useless, uh, it drowns the important stuff. It equals what is unimportant with what is important. Thus, it's, it makes it hard to distinguish what's important, what has value, with what hasn't value. And that, I think, is, 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 is quite and quite an important aspect to keep in mind. The second threat of this is on the behalf of the, the sharer, the, the person, the you, that is sharing. Because what is happening when you are so visible? Well, your behavior is changing. Washington University law professor Neil Richards is, is concerned with what he calls intellectual privacy. And by that he means 
that not only what you read, but how you read it is important to how you assess the information and how you judge the information. And I think he's right, because we know from research that you change behavior. You change when you're being watched. Uh, you become more predictable, you become more unspontaneous, you become more prone to follow patterns and re-established rules, uh, fast food, intellectual thinking. All those things are easier to, to grab onto when, you are, when you're watched. So to create the space where you can retract from the spotlight and think freely is becoming more and more precious when everything is automated and you are on all the time. Uh, and there's a, uh, there's a further proof to this, because some, some of you might know this. Brainstorming, an idea invented by George Osborne in the 40s, I think. And we've all been victims to this. You know, we could take this room, and we could turn it into a round table. I would give you an assignment. I want you to be brilliant and come up with great ideas on the following issue. And chances are, you would come up with ideas. Some ideas who might even be good, but we know that most of you would underperform in such a setting. Most of you would not perform uh, to your potential in a big room. And why is that? Well, because it's hard. Because being watched, it's difficult to be creative, to come up with, with thoughts that are, to begin with, incoherent, that are fragile, that are based on assumptions and you're not sure what. It's very hard. To, uh, to expose yourself with that kind of thinking when so many people are, are watching. So yes, brainstorming comes, makes, produces ideas, but very seldom uh, to the best potential of those participating. So I, as a designer, I, I'm not going <laughs> to design anything, but um, I, want to, I want to visualize this. Uh, and I visualized a house. That's, how brilliant I am. Um, <laughs> your mental capacity is a house. OK, we now know that uh, we now know that instinctively, you, you're coded to make that house an open place. I mean, your windows and doors are open all the time. It's nothing we can do very much about, because that's who we are. That's, we are human beings. Uh, we, we grave and we harvest, so it's open. The issue is more like our beautiful friends in the real estate business tells us. Where do you place your house? Location, location, location. If you place your house in a busy intersection, you know, you're going to be preoccupied, you're going to be busy receiving, receiving, receiving until you fall asleep, until you die. Whereas if you place your house on a hill where you have the overview, where they have uh, the, uh, you know, you, you're not part of the daily traffic, but you can, you can at least see what's going on. You can keep a distance at the same time keep an overview, and you can probably keep your house a little bit more tidy. You have a little bit more control over your house. Now, this is my metaphor, so bear with me. Uh, but in that house, I think, uh, I think you should keep room for one thing that I find quite, uh, quite a big resource and, and something that is actually frowned upon in society, and that is boredom. Boredom is zero and the full-on sharing is 100. If you're always at 100, you are just receiving. You are not able to process, you're not able to deconstruct, you're not able to come up with any resistance. Again, we are coded to, you know, we are uh, genetically coded to embrace everything that's going on because we know, we don't have to ask ourselves, we know it's important for our survival. But if you are able to retract a little bit, place your house a little bit in the distance. You can still be part of it, but you can also keep a distance. If you create a room where there's nothing, you have space to create. Because boredom is the beginning of something new. It can be. You can take something in there, you can take what's, what's been shared with you, you can deconstruct it, you can find it boring, and you can have room to create something new. If you don't have room, you don't have room to create something new. So boredom is important. And this leads me to my semi-conclusion. And so sharing, I think, because of who we are, is a potential threat. Not, to, may, not maybe to our physical lives, but to two things, two abilities that are very important for us. One is critical thinking. If we don't have the time, if we don't have the space to think critically, 
or the space or the capacity to create, I think we are less, less human. We're taking out less of our potential. We'll be less happy, and we will lead shorter lives. That's my medical conclusion. <laughs> it's my diagnosis. But I think that's, that's sort of the basis of it. Unless you leave room for it actively, because your instincts will not take care of it, they, your instincts brought you this far, but from now on, you have to take bigger, bigger control of it. So my conclusion. As constraints used to lie in our surroundings, you must take more control. You must offer more assistance, because most of us will face health issues when it comes to nutrition. Most of us will, over, will, will have problems with overnutrition. Uh, so if you uh, eat less, and if you receive less, place your house somewhere, uh, be like Noah, build an ark, and see the tsunami of garbage go by, you'll be more happy, you'll, you'll live longer. Share less, because if you do, you protect yourself, you protect the fragile you that needs space, that needs privacy to come up with better thinking, critical thinking, and creativity. And be bored, because boredom is a great asset. It's the start of something new. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.